Paul Harrell, weekdays from 4 to 6. Learn more at paulharrell.com. The program today. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, my name is Paul, and you have found the intersection of conservative ideas and reality where we are building a liberty machine. The phone number, if you want to call us or text us today, 870-275-9799 is the telephone number. Uh, joining us now, I want to welcome back to the program, we have the president of the Family Council, Mr. Jerry Cox is on the line. Jerry, welcome back, sir. Well, it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, sir. Uh, and it's I'm, I'm always uh, thrilled to have you on um, because, uh, first of all, you know, the Family Council, you guys have been around for for a long time, and you were one of the hardest working organizations in the state of Arkansas, uh, you know, advocating for conservative values. Uh, we're going to throw your website actually up on our, our live stream, but just kind of give us a rundown. You know, tell us what the Family Council is all about. Remind our audience. Well, Family Council was established by me back in 1989, and we are a multi-issue pro-family organization. Uh, we are pro-life. We are pro-traditional marriage. We believe in limited government. We believe that taxes are too high, and we believe that um, the less government, the better for families out there who are just trying to make a go of it. And so uh, if any of your listeners know anything about a group called Focus on the Family and Dr. James Dobson out of Colorado Springs, we are actually associated with them, and our views align very much with theirs. But I, I, in a simplistic way, tell people that we take the values of Sunday morning church and we carry them into the halls of government. Mm -hmm. And so that obviously takes us lots of different directions. We go to the Capitol and we lobby on legislation. I think we secured passage of over a dozen bills uh, this go around, and um, you know we tried for some and didn't make it. We were trying for a bathroom privacy bill, much like what they passed in North Carolina, and we were not successful in getting that done. But we did get about nine pro-life bills passed. Yeah, yeah, uh, and there was, like I said, and I read your April newsletter, and you know, we'll get to more of that here in a minute. But you, you certainly did say uh, that there were some good things done. On the uh, so-called bathroom bill, which, like you said, I think is more accurately described as a privacy bill, um, kind of walk us through that. I mean, because I mean, I was talking to some senators who said, hey, this is an issue back home in my district. We've got, you know, locker rooms and, you know, people are trying to go in this locker room or that locker room. So it is a problem. But that, you know, down at the uh, Marble Palace, they tend to say, hey, th this isn't really a problem. We don't need to be we don't need to be doing this. So so how, why, why what what all happened behind the scenes there? Well, you know, it's all said and done. Some of this stems all the way back to uh, 2015 when we were able to pass a religious freedom bill that a number of LGBTQ individuals thought somehow would infringe on their rights. And so they all came to the Capitol and they protested and carried on. And I think uh, the governor and some other lawmakers decided, you know what, we don't want those people back out here. And the best way to keep them home is to not run any legislation that aggravates them. And so early on, the governor said, we don't need a bathroom privacy bill. And let me clarify what that bill is. It, it just says that if a facility is funded with tax dollars, then men and boys have to use the men's facility, and girls and women have to use the women's facility. It wouldn't even affect Walmart or Target or any private place out here, but at our schools, our colleges, our state parks, our public buildings, then if you're a male, you go in the men's side, and if you're a female, you go in the women's side, and that includes showers and locker rooms. And, Paul, I thought all the time I was growing up there was a law that said men had to use the men's restroom. I think I did, and, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But there's not. If you, if you, I believe right now, if you just walked in there, used the restroom, washed your hands, and walked out, I doubt that anybody could charge you with a crime. Uh, now, if you're harassing or stalking or doing other things in there, yeah, they could probably get you. But um, I, it's just a common sense kind of bill. But the governor and others said, not necessary, not a problem. But are we going to wait until some little girl is, uh, you know, molested in a bathroom by some man? Uh, before we say it's a problem, I thought we were about preventing bad things from happening rather than waiting for it to happen and then try to close the barn door afterwards. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I'm glad that you, you know, in talking about this, you referenced what happened in, in 2015 with the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. I mean, because that was, um, you know, there was a, the initial version that was better than the one that we ended up with. Yes. And uh, in large part, um, you know, let me ask you this. You think those protesters that came down in 2015 and, and maybe some of the corporations that called the governor, I mean, that's kind of why the bill that he did support, the the original Religious Freedom Act, he decided not to support that any longer. Oh, I, I think uh, definitely the, uh, the the protesters, the, the gay protesters, got all the media attention stirred up, but the corporate interests were the ones that really put the heavy pressure on, uh, you know, Walmart, uh, Tyson, J.B. Hunt, different ones like that that made their voices heard on it. I think that made made the, the difference and caused the governor to say, let's do a, a, a weaker version of this. But you know, to me, when people say, well, it's not a problem here, but we know it's been a problem elsewhere, it's a little bit like somebody saying, well, we've never had a terrorist bombing in Arkansas, so we don't have to worry about a terrorist bombing here. Well, if it's going on elsewhere, then you figure we ought to prepare ourselves for something here, and and that's true with these privacy bills. They have had issues elsewhere, largely in schools where some mother would decide that her 14-year-old son really is identifying as a girl, and pretty soon they're trying to put him in the locker room with the 14-year-old girls, and it just creates all kinds of issues. Or we have uh, boys out here declaring themselves to be girls, and then once they do that, they're dressing with the girls, but they're also running on the girls' track team and play, trying to play girls' sports. And it just it just has a ripple effect that goes all over the place. Yeah, you're you're certainly right about that. And speaking of, you know, uh, this idea of we don't need to address a problem until it exists, they they actually did do something like that. Uh, that uh, I can't remember the name of that designated survivor. You know that that TV show about uh, uh, everybody in Congress and everybody you know is killed yeah. in a terrorist. Attack. I believe yeah. Yeah. I believe the legislature down in Little Rock they actually they didn't have a plan if something like that were to happen. That's right. And they yep, addressed they it this last session. So, Which is good. I'm I'm glad they did. I exactly. hope it's a good solution. But um, anyway, there's there's just that. And see, once the uh, governor made his pronouncement that this is not a problem and we don't need this, then far too many lawmakers just kind of sat down and said, well, okay, then we won't do anything. Yeah. And that I find very disappointing. I, I In fact, I've been going to the Capitol really since Bill Clinton was governor. And I think, in many ways, this legislative body was one of the least independent-thinking bodies that I've seen in a long time. Because many times, Paul, I would ask a lawmaker about sponsoring a bill, and they would the first thing they would say was, well, let me go check. Well, well check with who? Well, I need to check with House leadership, or I need to check with the governor's office, or I need to check with this this group of people. And I'm like, can't you think for yourself? Why do you have to go get permission to file a bill? I thought you were, you know, a strong, independent person out here. But we saw that far too many times. Or a person would file a bill, and then the leadership would say, don't you run that bill. And they would just wilt in the face of that and not run the bill. I had people promise to run bills that we wanted, and then... You know, they'd say, well, I've decided not to run it. Well, why? Well, leadership really doesn't want that. And that's just the end of it then. And so I find that very disappointing. You write in your, uh, we talked about this a few days ago, in the April 2017 uh, Family Council uh, update, um, you, you said this in the second paragraph, the first trend is a new breed of lawmaker who is guided too much by legislative leadership and the governor instead of the party platform, their core beliefs, or the constituents back home who helped them get elected. Yes. Um, and, and so that I, I, it's, it is kind of strange, you know, you being there since Bill Clinton was governor and, you know, Republicans are supposed to be the party of family values. They run on that. Matter of fact, it's I consider it kind of a low hanging fruit issue because I think it's something that so many of us agree on, and then they 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 are not allowed. They think they're not allowed to vote because the leadership doesn't want them to. I mean, that's got to be really frustrating for somebody like you, who I'm sure, you know, could see, uh, you know, that the Republicans are supposed to be the ones that 
you know, uh, are siding on on your side of the issues that you care about. Well, and the other thing that concerns me is I'm afraid that the the people that the establishment at the Capitol, House leadership, the governor, Senate leadership, and others, I'm afraid the folks that they recruit to run for these vacant seats may be people that are even more so that way, even less independent, even less, you know, think on their own, stand on their own kind of people. And so if we end up with a legislative body where a few people say, hey, you have to do what I tell you to do because I got you elected, you know, I've got a pack over here that's funding you, and you better sit down and be quiet, and you'll do what I tell you to do, then we have lost that autonomy of the legislative branch and the really the, the, the separate the power then is being consolidated in the hands of just a few people who are able to order everybody else around. Now, we're not at that point right now, but things are trending that way, and I hope it stops and goes back in the direction of having 135 independent lawmakers that think on their own, act on their own, and let the bills rise or fall based on the merits of the bill not based on what some person in a leadership position wants to yeah. happen. Well, and, you know, you raise an interesting point, this idea of, of vacancies or, or primaries. I mean, do, do you think that maybe uh, the people of Arkansas should pay attention uh, in some of these Republican primaries that are, that are inevitably going to happen uh, of, of which person in leadership is supporting? Because I, I got a feeling, I mean, we've already had this precedent. The governor took sides in the 2016 primaries. I got a feeling he's going to take sides this this time uh, next year. And so, I mean, do you think they need to kind of be watching? Uh, oh, my, yes. Yeah. Uh, because, see, here's the thing. A number of Republicans who have run and are running probably this time around 15 years ago would have been Democrats. They, they would have run as Democrats. And so um, what you have are people that are, uh, saying, you know what, to get elected, I need to be sure I'm a uh, I'm a Republican. But I don't know if their core values really align with that much with the party platform. And so that's something that people ought to delve into a little bit deeper is say, okay, I see you have an R by your name, but do you really believe the Republican Party platform and the values of the party? Now, do I think the Republican Party platform is perfect or that, you know, they're the ones that are Christians and Democrats aren't? No, absolutely not. And, you know, what I do is I look at what our standard is here at Family Council, which is marriage ought to be the union of a man and a woman. The unborn ought to be protected. And women and girls shouldn't have to share a bathroom with men and all those things. You're a radical, whichever, that, What a radical idea. <laughs> yeah. And so whichever party comes closest to that, then I'm over I'm over there with them. And so but that's the question people need to be asking of some of these candidates. Do you really believe these moral principles uh that that have guided this party for a long time or are you just kind of along for the ride and and not really, you know, don't really care much about those. Yeah. And so I think that's important. I mean, you know, I, I gave uh, I gave the Democrats a ton of criticism, uh, the ones who claimed to be pro-life and then didn't vote to override Governor Mike Beebe's veto of great pro-life legislation, you know. And they said, right. well, our, the governor's a constitutional scholar or the governor told me not to, so I didn't. What's the difference in that scenario? And now Republicans saying, oh, I can't run this bill or I, I, I can't support your bill because the governor doesn't want it even though it's one of these issues that the people of arkansas uh, agree with support overwhelmingly. sure yeah or, or there's no difference really between when mike Beebe would send uh his staff into a committee meeting to kill one of our pro-life bills this time around the governor sent three of his staffers along with the surgeon general into the public health committee to stop our health care freedom of conscience bill that would have ensured that little people out here working in a hospital couldn't be compelled to get involved in performing abortions or doing other procedures that violate their conscience. And so I, I, there's no difference between that. And so, 
does this administration support pro-life? Yes, they do. But the minute that it gets crossways with corporate interests that don't want freedom of conscience legislation and bathroom bills and that kind of thing, then I find myself on the short end of the stick every time that happens. Hmm. Yeah, and that's that's incredible. Yeah, and that's from that's another part of this this letter uh, from back in April that uh, I guess the committee that voted this down. Uh, 80% of the committee membership is pro-life Republicans, but the bill failed. And uh, you say that's because the governor uh, sent some people in there to say, hey, this is not a good idea. Yes. Wow. Unbelievable. And and I'm glad, I'm, I'm so glad, Jerry, that you came on the program, president of the Family Council, everybody, because, um, I, you know, this is uh, this is some of the stuff that I've been saying. And so, and you know, I'm, I focus, uh, I love the, the family value stuff, but, you know, I focus on the economic stuff. But the, the this is kind of happening across the board uh, with the Republican Party platform. And so it's very helpful to have you on to, you know, shine a light on this. And, uh, you know, you're experiencing the same thing. And, and hopefully uh, we can get our uh, politicians to make different choices well i have a greater respect for liberals who have resolve and will stand up and just stand by what they believe many times than i do people that have no backbone and no resolve to stand up for anything other than what somebody tells them to and that's that's what troubles me about some folks now they're not all that way I mean, most many of our lawmakers are really solid, good folks, and I would give them very high marks uh, for their performance. But like I said, some are not everything that they claim to be, and, you know, that's disappointing. Jerry Cox, president of the Family Council. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on. All righty. Have a great day. Folks, the website is familycouncil.org, by the way. Isn't that right, Joe? Familycouncil.org. Go and check them out. They are really good folks. Got to go to break. Back in a minute.